How are you doing? Good morning. My name is Luciano Silvera. I am part of the Enterprise AI team. And following a little bit what Gustavo said today, the idea is that I am going to show you what RAG is, how we are using it in Enterprise AI, and how you can use it. So before starting, I would like to refer to this IDC consulting firm, which makes predictions, analyzes the market, etc., and talks about unstructured data, precisely what I am going to talk about. That's how to exploit that structured data, which is often called dark data because it is data that is there, but we do not have the technology to be able to exploit that information. Those 175 zettabytes are 175 and 21 zeros after that. Okay? If you do the math, the 80% of that structured data that we don't analyze is 140 zettabytes of data that's out there globally and we don't have ways to exploit it, to do things about it. So uh, with this technology, with LLMs, which is an amazing piece of technology and techniques on top of that, like RAG that we can use, we have a super interesting alternative to provide intelligent bots to start having intelligent conversations for our end users, okay? So I'm going to focus on like three main pillars, a little bit understanding what RAG is, what components are underneath, how it's combined, let's say for LLM, to give the best information available to the LLM to synthesize an answer or whatever I want it to do. What do we have in Genexus Enterprise AI today to do this? And we'll show a use case where we walk through everything. This week, we are making public a documentation assistant in the wiki that knows everything about Genexus from the public information that you can already access, and that is available. So let me tell you a little bit about the process we have been going through. So let's start briefly defining what LLMs are. A lot has already been said in this event, but I would just like to emphasize that, well, the input is text and the output is text. So in order to understand to be able to direct that LLM to do what I want, well, I need prompt engineering techniques, which I don't think are engineering, but, well, it is the way we have to direct precisely to indicate what we want them to do in our favor. And related to this, there is a specific talk by Eric and Agustin this afternoon that I recommend because they have tips, tweaks, tricks, everything related to this, which is a new area that is a fundamental part for when we have to interact with an LLM to get the most out of it. So the LLM actually are from different types, different capacities, oriented to receive different tasks. There are some public, some private. So sometimes we don't know what they were trained with. So a black box, gray box, and so on. How can we use it to our advantage so that it can answer information from our organization? There are two techniques, fine-tuning or retrieval augmentation. By fine-tuning, it is generally used when you want to learn new capabilities or new jargon or things that you were not trained or that you want, or I want to indicate to it that I want the output in a specific way. So it has a cost in the sense that it needs training data. I mean, that training data I have to be able to provide in the process when it is doing the fine-tuning input, output, many thousands of data to be used for tuning, and then I have to evaluate if that new model fits what I need. That's one valid way to do it. Another way is to use retrieval augmentation, a way in which I am adding the context that it needs. Let's go back to the LLM. Uh, the LLM has a context of information that I can work with defined. They are getting bigger and bigger. I have two Ks, four, 16, 120 to work with to shape what I need to do. Retrieval augmentation involves considering the techniques I can apply at the retrieval level. The aim is to inject or provide the necessary knowledge about the user's query so that the LLM has all the information required to synthesize a more refined response or fulfill the task requested via the prompt in an enhanced manner. So let's start a little bit with retrieval augmentation first. 
It appears straightforward on the surface, searching for references or content related to my query in documents and unstructured data, incorporating that information into the prompt text and then instructing the LLM to generate a generative model based on this input information in response to the user's question. It's not that simple in the sense that this is natural language. Natural language entails numerous considerations. Uh, for example, take this example, I want to know something about underwater related activities. Using conventional search techniques like keyword matching or databases might not yield highly relevant results with semantic connections. There exist technologies that are unable to capture this semantically rich information. This becomes crucial when engaging in conversations with bots requiring semantics that comprehend my needs beyond a basic query. Hence, there's a necessity for innovative concepts and technologies to provide the LLM with the most comprehensive context possible. In this context, Two interrelated elements are at play within embeddings, a numerical representation at the paragraph or text level. These representations are constructed by machine learning models designed for this specific purpose. Essentially, when working with embedding models, it's crucial to scrutinize how they were trained and understand their characteristics. Two key considerations come into play, dimensions and SQL length. Dimensions pertain to the expressiveness of the model and the features of the input text we aim to obtain in the form of an array of numbers. SQL length, on the other hand, defines the extent to which the model can accommodate input length, whether it's a single word, a set of words, or multiple paragraphs. And I can ask, well, give me this representation in numbers if it were in three dimensions. I would get this drawing that I have here. So for that word, I do the calculation and I get what you see here. For example, that is the representation in that dimension. So from this embedding, there is specific software, which is the vector store, which has algorithms that are efficient in finding everything semantically related to what I am looking for. That's how then With this combination of techniques, I can achieve a retrieval of something semantically similar to a query that the user is making. Here, if you are interested, is the link. There are emerging models akin to LLM, specifically designed to enhance the process of obtaining mathematical models for better representation in numbers. Ultimately, this numerical representation is crucial for machines to better assist us. Consider this as one of the essential components in the framework of web retrieval. On our end, it involves processing unstructured data, recognizing that embeddings come with a maximum size constraint. To address this limitation, we implement a chunking strategy, breaking down the unstructured information, whether it's within documents, PDFs, or other formats, into manageable portions, each chunk undergoes the creation of embeddings, generating representations in numbers. These representations are then sent to a dedicated store. So now I can consult and it's all solved? Well, actually not. There is something fundamental, which is unstructured data. You have to look at the data. You have to analyze the data. There's a phrase that says that data is the cause of all your problems, okay? Particularly in the context of ingestion. It is vital to assess where the information comes from or if you need to filter it at the parsing level, take out control characters or other types of characters or normalize it. Because all of a sudden, probably, they come from different data sources, come up with a common normalized or summarized definition. Maybe there are certain data that are actually very detailed and I might be interested in doing a summation ingesting just that summation into my vector store. It's like several things to keep in mind, 
And the last part that is important is the enrichment. It's, as I'm doing this data enrichment process, it's important to think about this unstructured data. Where does it come from? How can I enrich it so that it can then provide value specifically in the other stages, in the stages that the end user is querying? This is what I mean by saying, for example, this is legal data. Within legal, these documents are related to these other things. So at ingest time, I can add this useful information so that later at retrieval time, I get the best context, the best data related to what the user is querying. This is at ingestion level I had to tell you about. So a chunk looks a little bit like this, a paragraph or whatever I define because I... The development team defines how the division of this unstructured information is going to be. The overlapping part is natural language. So many times in order not to lose semantics between these chunks, that in fact in the vector store there are going to be chunks distributed around, then sometimes it is convenient to overlap them a little bit with 100 characters, 200 characters, so as not to lose that semantics while I am moving between chunks and some other considerations. And here, simply to detail, different kind of metadata that is useful for later that when solving a query, we can also show that the data source where I got the information from is part of the metadata that I elaborated when I did the ingest part. Good. Another significant component tied to LLM is what's referred to as the context, the scope of information it can effectively process. As of November 2023, LLMs have specific characteristics. And it's worth noting that this landscape evolves rapidly. Newer models may introduce different processing capabilities. Currently, with the existing models, there's a limitation to the context they can handle. Models with extensive context often encounter challenges when dealing with tasks that involve solving problems across a lengthy span of information. When presented with a task that involves analyzing three, four, five, or 10 sheets of plain text and a corresponding query, these models may struggle with the information from the middle section in other words, they manage to retain or synthesize information from the beginning and the end of what we are going through. And in the middle, nothing, it does not process it. So even if it has a large context, at the end of the day, when I prompt, let's solve this query, I'm not really using that context in the best way. So it's also another knob, another thing that we have to take into account. Let's say that sometimes we don't have the result we expect and answer a query with a given context. And well, this is also another point to take into account. We have to see what model we are using, what characteristics it has, and the benchmarking, let's say, how it is doing in the different, for different stages or different ways of using it. Good, so uh, up to this point, it's the first stage. In other words, this is a rag, that's what it is. I retrieval augmented generation, so I use embeddings, I use vector stores, I process my data, ingest, and then I use LLM, where the LLM, I programmatically have to give it all the necessary context for it to be able to return a decent answer. From the GeneXus Enterprise AI perspective, it acts as an assistant. You create a new assistant, chat with documents, preloaded with information, all these components I've been mentioning are preloaded with something predefined. Afterward, you can touch and adjust all those layers based on your needs according to your tests and how it's performing for you. Essentially, you'll have a customizable prompt where you specify what you want to do. For instance, answer me in this way, provide information about legal matters or whatever is necessary. This is parameterized at the enterprise AI orchestration layer passing through the RAG layer. Here, it injects and retrieves the closest associated information to my query. I have additional controls, such as adjusting how I want to obtain that semantic information from the vector store. I'm referring to various options, like different forms of multi-query guides. There are like different ways based on the user query that I can request to the LLM. 
enrich me this query in the GeneXus context or whatever. So the query changes, and I could go first to the vector store to obtain that information. I could use, for example, self-query. So I could use self-queries to work with metadata. For the user's query, I can ask for these metadata with filters. Then the LLM will search for the matching data to make a more specific filter for that query. This way, I go to the vector store with something much more refined, having the possibility to obtain a context much closer to what I'm looking for. I have the option to play with the score threshold. I mean, when I go to the vector store, I can say, give me the three best chunks related to this, and it returns a score from zero to one. One is an exact match, meaning semantically an exact match. So I have all these parameter combinations to play with, aiming to achieve the best response to the user's query. Let me tell you a little bit at the architecture level, a little bit bottom up of the things that happen when you interact with chat with documents, if you will. So I begin at the ingestion level. Ingestion works at the document level, PDFs, word files, plain text, or even from another source. We're developing an SDK that you can use with various programming languages. It includes an ingestion component. This ingestion involves connectors that can link to common data sources. You access your data and then use our ingestion tool to upload information to enterprise AI. So we start with documents. Um, Something important that I forgot to mention is that we are currently processing text in chat with documents. However, the multimodal option is already here and we are incorporating it. This means that you can ingest documents with images, audio, and more. All this information is something that embedding models have the capacity to handle, providing related information. Therefore, chat with an instructor, data, or documents has the ability to search for information at the level of images or non-text content. Now, moving on to documents, you upload them. There's an API, or for quick prototypes, you can use the Enterprise AI console directly to upload documents and start chatting there to evaluate. Internally, as I mentioned today, according to our default configuration, it chunks every thousand characters with a stride of 100 characters. This is automatically embedded and stored in a vector that the entire infrastructure manages. So once you have each document, it has a status. When it's accessed, the in-context learning, that part of retrieval augmentation, is already completed. Thus, you have a workspace to work on to make queries. You can already start using it. All this information, ingestion, retrieval, is concealed in what is an assistant chat with document type. Since it's a chat with document type, it has a search profile, a set of information associated with all these parameters that can be modified to enhance interaction with the assistant. From the end user's perspective, it's just an API. I provide the query, go to the specified profile with the designated API token, and simply await the response to begin interaction. Okay, now I will tell you a little bit about how we are moving through this within the documentation assistant that I mentioned at the beginning. Let's see. The idea is this week, this is iteration one. To reach this iteration one, we went through about 10 versions of the ingestion database with different features, testing various mechanisms until we achieve something decent in terms of response. However, we really need all of your help. So you are all invited to try it out and provide us with feedback. We specifically want the bot to evolve in the best possible way and assist everyone in resolving all GeneXus related queries in the most effective manner. Currently, it primarily has knowledge about GeneXus and the latest version, okay? But also, let's say we want to support it with other things as well. Today, you only consult from the website. Well, something happened. 
I lost contact. All right, as I continue sharing, uh, currently it directly queries from the wiki, wiki.genexus.com, uh, but the idea is for it to be wherever it needs to be, if it needs to be in the IDE so that while I'm working on programming tasks, I can ask questions and have the co-pilot there to assist me, it will be there. If we need to add more data sources to expand the range of responses for what you need, it will be there. All right, continuing. You log in and you'll have a little button that says chat, an icon for the bot. So the bot has something really cool that you can see. Let's see, it's an interaction with the bot and we are creating a document with the best practices, but we are also experimenting. In other words, these best practices will change according to how we think is the best, how is the best way to take advantage of the bot, the best way to take advantage of this assistant, okay? There he came back. Well, if it's back, Let me show you here. So there it is running, yes. Let me show you. This wizard, here we are running. That is, we are in the console, in the enterprise AI console. The enterprise AI console. I mean, it's just, we're calling an API to enterprise AI, to the profile, to the chat with document QA. This doesn't want to well, give me a second. I might run out of internet. I have a plan B. Let's go. There. Got it. Good. Wait. Too fast. Okay. So the wizard just calls Enterprise AI to this profile, to this chat with document. Here's the prompt engineering part that we have done. So basically, we're directing it how you want it to respond. The information just responds related to Genix's documentation. Please don't beat around the bush. Here you see context. Context is the context variable that is going to be injected with the relevant information. There. The context is the information that will be injected. It's precisely the rag going to the vector store to obtain what is semantically closest to what the user queried. Then, when operating in chat mode, I have ways of indicating from those few conversations which ones I want to maintain in the context. In other words, for it to truly function as a chat, enabling me to have an interaction. This is what we'll be looking at here. This is the second template that we can adjust precisely because it involves rephrasing. The query, when in chat mode, I keep asking, but we enhance it with a second prompt. This is happening quite quickly. We augment it with a second prompt to not lose the context of what the bot has been asking and answering, along with the new query. All of this is parameterizable. Here's the configuration. Another tweaking we can do is see how I go to the vector store, how I have that information. Whether I go directly with what the user is asking or with that augmented question or play with other mechanisms, for example, multi-query. So I make an extra call to the LLM to generate questions similar to what the user is asking, providing a broader range of possibilities for valid contexts for that response. There are many little things there. I can play with the score threshold. I also have the possibility, for example, in this case, it's another use case, but graph. If you have databases associated with graphs, we can connect this tool and have it directly transform this into a graph query and execute it. So, in natural language, I'm working with unstructured data. It's like another available flavor. Related to what the chat is, let me hear. This is what I was mentioning. This is the way to specify how I want to interact with the bot. I want the last four interactions. And when I'm going to retrieve the latest related documents or the latest chunks related to this, I want the last five. Okay. That's what I was talking about. 
if you are logged in, you have the little button to access it. There we have four sample queries, as if they were of different types for your reference. And here then, well, let's let it run. We would like you to click on the link which tells you how to use it. And here I wanted to highlight this question that I found very good. It is, how do I define a compound data type? I just said that and Well, I executed the rag, went to fetch what's related, and it went and brought me information about SDT. In other words, the semantic part is working, and it resolved it well. Indeed, this response is a very good one associated with how I do it. It has an example. And there below, you have the five documents that I have configured and associated. They have the link. You can see the source from where I obtained that information. So from there, well, I can start. Perhaps, yes. I'm interested, okay? Structured data type, well, give me an example. Give me something more, let's say, to continue this conversation. And that's what I asked. And this is the second answer where it goes into even more depth of how to define an SDT elements in the query. Let me pause. Uh, the elements, the sub-elements. In other words, the response is super detailed explaining how to do something complex with the associated links. It's really interesting. All right, this is the chat. Now, let's take a look at the enterprise AI part to see what happened, how these queries I've been making worked, what happened. So here I went to enterprise AI, to the request section. And I can see the detail. For example, in this case, we can see, here it is, give me a concrete example to get started. We can know that this query took 22 seconds and that it broke down into these three calls. And here we can see, for this query, it was augmented with this second prompt that I was telling you about. From there, let's see. Then it was augmented with that information. The embeddings went there to obtain the related information, to obtain the array of bytes of associated numbers it gets the context, it gets the LLM, and evaluates a response, and that's what the end user gets back. We have the information of, well, how much did it cost, the status. For example, here I wanted to show you the score. There we have internally the JSON, all the information that travels in the associated scores that I have. This is programmatically available to everyone. We are just not showing it here because we are not interested in it, but via API can get it all. I have the details of the model there. We are using GPT-4, the version of two weeks ago. There, there you can see the embeddings going through. It is just that representation that can be useful for something else. And this one, for example, here it is, is a little bit fast. So, Here, for example, in the console, you can see exactly how it executed the rag with the different parameters. And starting from the user's question and the response, it shows everything that was injected exactly and all the decisions and the components involved, let's say, to respond to that end user query. Okay, I'll come back here. This should be it. No, this is not it. No, this is not it. Wait. Got it. This, well, this is a little bit of a summary of what I wanted to show you. We provide assistance that can truly leverage the unstructured data within your organization. We want to expose a super lightweight layer at the level of assistance that you can define, that you can pick such or such assistant and answer such a query. And let GeneXus Enterprise AI handle everything underneath this so that you can, as always, focus on the business and what you need to resolve instead on how. Related to this, there are several talks in the GX30 around Enterprise AI and LLMs. Also, later in the afternoon, if you are interested, there is also a talk about prompt engineering. 
Also in the afternoon at 3 o'clock, we have an enterprise AI lab where you will be able to create wizards and see that so you can see it. Also, if you are interested, I wanted to invite you to subscribe and, well, have access and you can test and you can test this scheme, let's say, with a couple of exploratory documents to see how it goes in your use cases. That is all. While I remain at your disposal for any questions. Thank you very much.